Hi, this is Eric Primack, a special education teacher in Austin, Texas, and you're listening to the AT Tips Cast. Hello and welcome to the AT Tips Cast, exploring and investigating different implementation of assistive technology in public schools. I'm your host, Chris Bouguet. This is episode number three, recorded on February 2nd, 2008. Federal law states that AT needs to be considered for each student with an individualized education plan, but different school districts have found different ways to address this during their IEP meetings. So, what are some different ways districts have attempted to consider assistive technology for every student? First, let's start with the semantics, and specifically, the interpretation of the word considered. According to thefreedictionary.com, the definition of considered is as follows. Reached after or carried out with careful thought. Deliberate. A little side note here, I really like this online dictionary because as as you just heard, it has a free, yep, free audio component that lets users listen to words they look up. The voice saying considered is directly from that website. Now, I should point out that I'm not a lawyer, so don't hold me to this, but I think some districts may have interpreted the word considered to mean checkboxed. That is, somewhere on the IEP paperwork, there might be a checkbox that states, has assistive technology been considered? And then before or after the statement, there's a box to check. This method, I guess, is technically accurate, but I think it might allow people to skip over the careful thought or deliberate part of the definition for considered. Another way districts consider AT is by having checklists of many different possible assistive technologies. The IEP team then uses the list to pick and choose what the student might need. This method moves more towards the careful thought, but lists of this nature can in no way really be comprehensive. The amount of tools and strategies a student might use is literally endless, so it's impossible to consider everything by just looking at a checklist. Plus, having a checklist can be more of an impulsive list or shopping list, where IEP team members might be influenced just by the sheer fact that they see something on the list. So therefore, they think the student would benefit from it. Rather than thinking, is this necessary for a free and appropriate public education, they might think, ooh, I see this on the list. I guess my student should have it. Another way that assistive technology might be considered on an IEP is by considering the accommodations and modifications that are built into IEPs. That is, you might make the argument that accommodations and modifications are assistive technology. For instance, if a student needs a piece of equipment or piece of software for a free and appropriate public education, then it should be listed as an accommodation or modification on the IEP. By considering what the student needs for accommodations and modifications for a free and appropriate public education, the IEP team is, in fact, considering assistive technology. Finally, I have seen assistive technology written into goals as part of the consideration process. For instance, you might find a goal that says, using graphic organizing software, Margaret will write a five paragraph essay, etc., etc. Or, using his communication device, Tucker will answer who and what questions, etc., etc., etc. In these examples, the IEP team has stated technology in the goal but consider how strange the goal would sound if we wrote them the exact same way if the student didn't need assistive technology. For example, using paper and a pencil, Margaret will write a five paragraph essay, or using his mouth, Tucker will answer who and what questions. It sounds awkward to include that extra information as part of the goal. What inevitably happens when placing technology in the goals is that an inconsistent model erupts from student to student. My point here is that it might be better to just state the goal without any mention of the tools and place the tools on the accommodations and modifications page. Here's an example. The goals might be written, Margaret will write a five paragraph essay, and Tucker will answer who and what questions. Notice that there is no mention of the tools they will use to work on the goal. Then, on the Accommodations and Modifications page, you might put, for Margaret, access to graphic organizing software during writing assignments of more than four paragraphs in length. And, for Tucker, use of a communication device during communication exchanges, or something like that. Am I being nitpicky here? Maybe. 
It doesn't really matter as long as each member of the IEP team knows what's happening and the student is making progress. But by having the assistive technology written in a consistent manner for every IEP, it helps to ensure that these tools are being considered for every student, not just the students with severe disabilities. A consistent method of giving careful thought to assistive technologies during IEP meetings helps ensure that no student slips through the cracks. Now for the AT tip for episode number three. Readability Statistics in Microsoft Word with our guest presenter, Bebot. Welcome to the show, Bebot. Thank you for having me. So there, Bebot, you got a trick for us today? Something we can use with the kiddos? Yes, after doing many calculations, I have devised a way to analyze text and determine the reading level of the text. Really? You mean like the readability statistics built into Microsoft Word? My analysis takes the length of sentences and the complexity of the words and determines a flesh Kincaid reading level. Wow, Bebot, that's just how Microsoft Word does it. That is impossible. Microsoft Word cannot do that. Only I, Bebot, can do that. Mm, sorry, Bebot, let me explain. If you go to Tools, Options, and select the Spelling and Grammar tab, you will see a box that reads Show Readability Statistics. If that box is checked, then the next time you complete the spell check function of Word, a window is displayed giving you all sorts of reading statistics, including the flesh Kincaid reading level. No, that is impossible. Word, impossible. Reading level, impossible. I was supposed to be the only one. No worries, Bebot. Don't strip your gears over it. You both can do it. Just, um, well, how many Bebot units are there out in public schools right now? I am the only one. I am unique. Well, Microsoft Word might be a little bit more widely used than you, Bebot. But don't worry, I know what you can do. Why don't you just explain some of the uses of the readability scores? You know, something like how teachers could copy and paste text from websites, unlocked PDFs, or other sources into Word, and then get the readability scores to see if the reading level of the material is too high for their students. Maybe as part of the editing process of an essay or other writing assignment, students could check their own readability scores. If it turned out to be too low, they could use the thesaurus feature of Word to come up with more complex sentences. Some students might find it fun to see how high they can go. There you go, Bebot. That's the spirit. You should remind people about your blog. Thanks for reminding me, Bebot. There will be a link to instructions on what Bebot and I just described, plus pictures of Bebot posted up on the AT Tips Cast blog site at attipscast.wordpress.com. Thanks, Bebot, for stopping by. Come back and visit soon. Do not tell me what to do. Yeah, okay. See you, Bebot. That about wraps it up for this week's episode. I want to give a shout out to our technology educators down in Texas who have the Texas Computer Education Association convention this week down in Austin, Texas. I hope you learn a lot and share great ideas. I mentioned that I attended FETC, the Florida Educational Technology Conference, last week. I'll be having a future episode on what I learned during that conference coming up soon. Also, if you are interested in doing a segment for the show, if you have any ideas for future shows, if you have any questions, or if you'd like to send me a voicemail, or if you really have anything at all, please email me at attipscast at gmail.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, may all your interventions be inclusive, and may all your strategies be supportive.